All right, my name is Crispino Lobo, and I represent an organization called the Watershed Organization Trust, which is an NGO that was established about 24 years ago in 1993 in India. Yes, we were founded to actually organize poor rural communities to help themselves out of poverty. And we work largely in rain-fed or drought-prone regions of India, in about seven states. Now you have to keep in mind that one of the big problems for poverty in these areas is because agriculture, which is the main livelihood base of people, as well as natural resources, depends on rainfall. And in these areas, which depend on the monsoons, we have at most four months of good rainfall. And of these, the number of what you call effective rainy days is not more than eight to 15 days per year in the areas we work in. So the bottom line is, if you are not able to harvest the rain that falls during these days, then you have trouble for the rest of the year. So our window of opportunity or our developmental opportunity is at most 15 days in the year. So our idea is to organize rural communities to catch rainwater wherever it falls in the places they live in, in the catchments they live in, in the watersheds they live in. So we, were, we, we organize rural communities to treat, develop and regenerate the, the watersheds and the landscapes in which they live. Right? Now we noticed in the last 10 years particularly that the pattern of rainfall has been changing in terms of intensity, frequency, extreme weather events and the, the quantity of rainfall falling. That was impacting the benefits from the work that the villages had done. In other words, agriculture productivity had started going down. There were more problems of pests and diseases. Rain that would come at a particular time was not happening. So we had also the problem of adequate water for agriculture as well as for drinking and livestock. So people began to see and we began to notice that climate change was happening in terms of climate variability and was affecting the livelihoods and quality of life of the people. That's when we decided we have to do something now, in addition to what we are doing, to do something to address the challenges that climate change is posing to these rural communities. The first thing we did was to develop a tool that would engage with communities to help them to assess how vulnerable they were to the various impacts of climate change, particularly changes in rainfall and rise in temperature. This tool is called CoDrive, which is Community Driven Vulnerability Evaluation, which actually helps communities to assess their capacity, their resilience levels, as well as to help them to identify ways to reduce their vulnerability. In other words, help them identify measures that, that can help them to adapt to climate change. So we developed this tool called CoDrive, which is freely available on the net. It's at, you can check it out at www.wotr.org. And it is supported by a software, which is a cloud-based software, which people can use, upload data, and get a full analytical report of the vulnerability, as well as resilience levels of a community. So that was first, because if you want to adapt, you need to know what you are vulnerable to, and then develop plans. The next thing is, we continued doing watershed development, but this time, we did it from the perspective of Hydrology, how is climate change going to affect hydrological flows and therefore how should we be doing the various vegetative, mechanical and hydraulic structures that we did before, how should we be doing it differently if at all, that's one. Secondly, we began to focus more on biodiversity because agriculture and most of the livelihoods in rural areas depend on nature and if nature is impacted adversely by climate variability like extreme weather events, then we had to also address the issue of biodiversity. And Lastly, it is we focused a lot on adaptive sustainable agriculture because that is in India 68% of agriculture depends on rain and 60% of our people depend on good agriculture for a livelihood. So we changed the way we did agriculture. We started moving now into what we call uh, environmentally friendly resilient agriculture, climate smart agriculture. Now that means what? Number one. We developed and evolved a system called the system for crop intensification, which has the following components. Number one, emphasis on indigenous or local cultivars. Secondly, crop geometry, the way you plant, the spacing within the plant matters. Thirdly, uh, soil health. We started focusing on developing more healthy soils because that is what makes agriculture sustainable. So less dependence on chemical inputs, more dependence on organic inputs and using of locally available material. The next thing is, ultimately, if agriculture doesn't result in income to farmers, then it's not going to be adopted. So we have started focusing on organizing farmers into collectives for marketing 
and to take a greater share of the value chain and greater market ex excess so that they have better income and ret returns from agriculture. That's what we did in terms of agriculture. So it is from the farm to the plate. That's an emphasis now that we are giving in terms of healthily produced and our outputs. The last thing is water budgeting. If water is a limitation and a major constraint, we have been training communities to plan, to assess how much of rainfall they have as it has fallen, how much of net water is available, and therefore what cropping pattern and crop management practices they should adopt to be able to meet the crop water requirements for the entire period of the crop growth cycle. And the last is agrometrology. With the government and with our national institutions in metrology, we are developing and giving farmers crop weather advisories which help them to respond to forecasted weather in an integrated and environmentally friendly measure. So agrometrology is another way in which uh, we are helping farmers to develop resilient and climate smart agriculture and livelihoods. Well, several, several. Now, if you look at, for instance, agrometrology, giving crop weather advisories to farmers, we need real-time data of a very high degree of resolution, not only in terms of forecast weather, but also in terms of soil moisture, for instance, in terms of what cultivars of the crops the farmer is growing, in terms of the soil health. So we need all this kind of data to be able to give precise advisories suited to the local condition of the farmer and his resource base. That's one. When you talk, for instance, of water resource management, we need to have not only information of the surface of water available on the surface, but also in the ground, as well as in the aquifers. Now, Indian agriculture is largely based on groundwater extraction, right? Way with rock. And groundwater science, as you know, is a rather imprecise science at present. So we need to develop more precise models which remove the uncertainty and increase the reliability of data which helps us to analyze and assess how much of water is available in the ground. Next, we need to improve soil health very rapidly. One of the big problems we are facing is the availability of biomass. It's not enough in most of the dryland areas of India. So how do we develop technologies which increase soil health so that microbial, biological activities increase without the massive inputs that we would require. So a very high degree of technology and science. Fourthly, we need also to understand better, better how climate science is actually impacting rural communities. How does it play itself out in their economy, in their livelihoods, in their social and cultural life? Because unless we understand that, we will not be able to tailor and craft initiatives and activities that actually address the problem. And lastly, it's expensive. I mean, farmers have limited means. And so public subsidies have to come in in helping them to, for instance, improving crop water use efficiency. The big slogan of the Prime Minister is more crop per drop. That means using the same amount or less water can we get more productivity. But in a way, that is nature friendly. So which sustains the economy, which sustains the natural resource base and still yields good income in the long term. Right? And we need more collaborative partnerships and arrangements because no single institution, however big, is able to address the challenges that climate, climate change is throwing to us, especially for the vulnerable poor. So we need collaboration between science, between politics, between governance, between the civil society, research and technical institutions at all levels in order to come out with an integrated, effective strategy for building adaptive capacities, reducing vulnerabilities and enhancing resilience.